Okay, the next step is to generate the count matrix. That's the key step in single cell ataxic analysis. So as I mentioned, the, usually the FASTQ files, FASTQ files are aligned to BAM file for each cell. And in the BAM file, there, usually there's a tag. If you look at the BAM file uh, specifically, there's a tag called CB or cell barcode containing the cell barcode information, telling you which cell this particular fragment is from. So we then call peaks for the pseudo bulk. So aggregate, aggregate all the cells together and call peaks using max two. And then we count how many reads in each of the peak for each of the cell. So in the end, you get this uh, peak by cell count matrix. And this matrix is very sparse uh, and even much sparser than single cell RNA-seq. So as we, as we mentioned, uh, that's because we only have two, co um, two copies of DNA, right? And for single cell, for RNA-seq, you can have multiple copies of that same transcripts. So this um, matrix is quite sparse. Okay, there are some technical considerations for single cell ataxic analysis. So one can either look at the reads on peaks in each cell. So this, what I just described is peak based. The other, the other tool called snap ataxic uses a beam based method. So essentially it tiled the beams across the genome, like five KB beams, and then you count reads in this five KB beam. But we know, we know like we have like uh, 3 billion bases and if you divide it by 5 kb, it will be around 0.6 million beams. So that's a lot of thing and the counting, uh, the calculation may be a little bit more computation intensive. Then after we get the counts, we generate this peak by cell count matrix or this beam by cell count matrix. As I mentioned, this uh, uh, matrix is very sparse. There's no UMI. And you can, all, because it's really sparse, anything bigger than two, uh, bigger than one, you can assign it as one. And if it's zero, let's say it's zero. So make the matrix binary. But for uh, this binary matrix, it needs a little bit of special treatment. We call a uh, TFIDF transformation. So I will explain this in the next slides. Uh, uh, the downstream analysis starts from this uh, sparse matrix. Let me explain what is TFIDF. So this TF-IDF or frequency inverse document frequency <laughs> transformation, this was firstly used in this paper, Darren et al. Uh, 2018 in cell. And they used this TF-IDF transformation to, uh, pro, uh, to normalize somehow uh, the single cell ataxic data. And in the methods, methods section, it says, so we first weight all the sites for individual cells by the total number of sites accessible in that cell. And that's the term frequency. And we then multiply this weighted value by log, then plus, uh, parenthesis one plus the inverse frequency of each cell across all cells. And this is the inverse document frequency. Then they use single value decompos decomposition, SVD, or PCA on the TF-IDF uh, transform the matrix to generate this no low dim dimensional representation of the data. So if you really translate into R code, it's not that uh, co uh, complicated. So if you, can, if you use R a little bit, you can read the code here. So you, you get the columns, column sums of that matrix, essentially the total number of accessible uh, region uh, peaks or the total number of peaks. And here, um, then you can just uh, divide it this, for each cell, you can divide this total number of peaks for each entry, right? And then now here you calculate the total, uh, the row sums essentially, how many cells for that particular peak uh, has, has, this, uh, has this peak or has this peak open. And this is and call uh, this is just total number of cells in in that uh, data matrix. And this is the inverse ratio, right? And now you after that you just uh, do a, a matrix multiplication. Oh, by the way, this function is implement, it implemented in Surat, so you don't have to do it you know, like manually here, like what I did here. Uh, but I do have a blog post here, a link here to explain what exactly TFIDF is doing here. 
And it is frequently used in text mining because that's why you see the uh, term frequency or document frequency is one can count the frequency of a word in a document and get the word by documents matrix. It's, it is also very sparse. And with this matrix, one can find which documents are more similar to each other. Maybe some of them are written by Shakespeare and then others are written by someone else and everyone has different preference of what, for the usage. Right. Okay, so after you get this TF-IDF uh, transform the matrix, now you will do a dimension reduction. So you run PCA first and then use top 15, uh, 50 components and build a K nearest neighbor graph. And this is the uh, most uh, popular or better performed method currently. And uh, so you can then use this a community uh, detection algorithm to detect how many clusters in this k graph. And later you can visualize uh, the clusters uh, in either UMAP or TSNI like this. However, I want to add one more uh, note for, for the clustering is because there are many parameters that you can fine tune. So for example, for the KNN, you can specify different K in thread, it's K like default is 30, but if you change that to 10, 20, it will give you more clusters. And there's another really critical uh, uh, parameter is called the resolution. So the higher resolution that you give into the algorithm, the more granularity that you get. So you also get more uh, number of clusters. So the bottom line is that we can always subcluster the cells and get more clusters. And theoretically, each, each cell can be its own cluster, right? And it really depends on how similar you want the cells to be within the same cluster. So the function of uh, mathematically identified clusters here need to be interpreted in the context of uh, biology uh, knowledge. So I would say uh, the, bio the knowledge of biology plays a more important role here. So in other words, finding the clusters is math, but interpreting the clusters is science. Okay. So this is an example uh, of single cell ataxic UMAP. Uh, with and or without TF-IDF in uh, transformation. So you're going to uh, do an exercise uh, uh, in homework five as well. So the figure on the left is the raw matrix, but without TF-IDF and, and then uh, and you do the cluster, uh, dimension reduction and clustering and project them in your map. And here on the graph on the right, we use this latent semantic index, essentially LSI is equal to TF-IDF followed by SVD or PSA, uh, PCA. Single value decomposition is down the line method uh, in PCA. So you will see if you, without TF-IDF transformation, the look of this TSNI plot, uh, this UMAP plot looks a bit funky. So you, you see this kind of, strange patterns of those things. But in, after TF-IDF transformation, you see much better uh, uh, representation. So it's quite similar to the single cell RNA cluster. Okay, uh, after we assign the cells to each cluster, for example here, so we assign each cells into uh, each cluster, uh, you, one can op optionally do a peak calling again. So why we want to do that, <laughs> right? Because sometimes, remember we call the peaks using all the cells, right? All the cells together and using max two. And you, if you look at here, there are some clusters that they're relatively small. And the, uh, the peaks which specific in those small clusters may be missed uh, when you uh, call peaks with all the cells together because it just get diluted, right? So what you can do, you can call peaks again, just within the each cluster. And now you can merge all the P 
pigs together and we generate this count matrix. So now you will have more pigs than previous that you have because now you have a lot more, a lot more uh, classes specific uh, pigs. And this is uh, very important for finding differential pigs, which is the next step. For example, if you don't start uh, record pigs within each cluster, you're going to miss those uh, uh, pigs that are specific to those small clusters. And if you don't have it to begin with, how can you find them out after a differential peak calling, right? You can't. So for the idea of a differential peak calling uh, is to, for each row or each peak, you calculate a differential enrichment between cluster one versus all other clusters. So whether this peak is preferentially open or not. And similar to the non-parametric test method for single cell analysis, you can use and when you test or Wilcox rank some test on the peak cell count matrix. And we know because uh, the matrix is really sparse in zero and ones, and, and to overcome this, uh, because if you have too many uh, ties, uh, Cox, Wilcox rank sum test doesn't perform well. So you can uh, somehow normalize the data in each cell and then scale to 10,000 10, uh, reads per cell. Or you can use that TFI uh, transform matrix uh, for Wilcox rank sum test. And there is a tool called Presto. It implemented a fast Wilcoxon test, which is ten, uh, which is a thousand fast, thousand times faster than in thread, because you can think about for single cell analytic, you have 20,000 20, rows, but for single cell ataxic, you can easily get three hundred k right rows. So it uh, if you have used this red find markers function, it, it sometimes takes a very long time. And especially for single cell ataxic, you might want to adopt this method because it will uh, get you the results uh, in maybe within 20 seconds instead of hours. So uh, I recommend you uh, check this one out. Okay. People are more interested in finding out uh, what the transcript factors binds to each cell. Right? And Cromwa was developed for this purpose. So what Cromwa does is for each cell, it comes the motif occurrence in the peaks and one can derive a TF binding score for each cell. And this gives you, gives you a general idea of the TF activity in each cell. And then, then you can overlay the uh, this uh, uh, TF activity score onto your map. And you may find some clusters that are enriched by certain TFs. So uh, for example, here is CBP alpha, then you see it's kind of high in this cluster and a little bit here. And ZEP1 is an, another transcription factor and it's kind of the activity is higher in the other clusters. Uh, but we all know that the occurrence of a TF in a genomic region does not mean the TF binds there, right? So to so we can uh, to do that, uh, we we can use public data sets to partially address the problem of annotating uh, TFs. So in our lab, we collected sixty thousand ChIP-seq DNA-seq profiles from public deposit data set into a database called CISTRON-DB. 